Good morning, church. Um, I just have a few announcements to begin with. Um, we have a first reading of a number of um, members to be transferred into Mildura. Um, so it's just the first reading. But Ina, and I'm going to get this totally wrong, so you can come and correct me later if you like. Ina Katongul um, from Geelong. Um, Shri Hardy from Springwood. Ellie Fraser Hardy from Springwood and Amy Jean Lowe from Abu Dhabi. Uh, that's just the first reading. If the deacons would like to um, stand up and lift up the offering now for our, um, for our visitors, this is a building offering, um, don't feel obliged, and this is for the, the maintenance and the running costs of our church. Um, if the deacons would like to Lift that offering, please. Isn't it wonderful to see those kids out there picking up that offering? Building maintenance. Building maintenance offering. We went to camp last week, big camp, a long way away. It was fantastic. So we've come home full of praise. On the piano, we have Liz, Christine, Xiang, and Fa, and I'm John. Let's stand together and open our worship with I worship you almighty God Please be seated. Um, if you'd just like to bow your heads um, for prayer. Almighty God, creator, redeemer of this earth, we ask that each head bowed here and those that are watching online humble our hearts in adoration of you, that our worship be uplifted to you and that as a congregation we will praise your name. We invite the Holy Spirit to find our hearts open to hear your words this morning. Amen. 
Well, I'd just like to welcome each and every one of you here this morning um, to the Mildura Seventh-day Adventist Church. We welcome you to the worship of the I Am, the worship of the living God, of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. And I pray that each of you are uplifted in our worship this morning. So again, welcome. And we want to encourage you guys to look for opportunities to connect. So get on board with the SAP pack, prepare on your Fridays, have everything ready to go and make the most of Sabbath with your community. Seasons of winter, and you give anything to feel the sun. Always reaching, always climbing, always second guessing the timing. But God has a plan, a purpose in this. You are His child, and don't. Happy campers, I'm Lorraine, and I'm here at the Connections tent, and so 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 glad to be back at camp. And some of the really cool things that we do at the Connections tent is we just love to worship God sing lots and hear the message um, but a very big part of what we do here is really try and connect people so whether that be through um, having a coffee and hot drinks machine and pastries in the morning to give people an opportunity to do that but also after every sermon we actually have people discuss a few questions and reflect on that and that's an opportunity once again for people to um, to connect and get to know each other so um, come along come and join in that clip. Great fun, great music, great speakers, and the food was pretty good. Denise and I were chained to the oven, but we got to a couple of meetings with Anthony. He is a superb speaker, and with age, he's got better. You can see him on YouTube. Please stand with us again as we worship with two songs. Here I am to worship and majesty. Let's stand together and praise.
and our majesty. Please be seated. Thank you. This morning, we have the opportunity to participate in our worship program by the giving of our tithes and offerings. And today's offering is an, a local offering. And that means that the monies given remain in Mildura today and are used for our church's expenses. So we'd like to pray over the offering before it's taken. So I'd ask the deacons if you'd come and stand over here Lord we thank you that you are faithful you are an abundant God and out of your great love and mercy you have given us so much thank you that we can worship you by giving our tithes and offerings we thank you for this church and we thank you for each person who attends bless these gifts for the sake of your kingdom and glory Amen. would all the children like to come down the front today? Pastor Natasha has chosen a special little film to be up on the screen for us this morning. So come down and have a seat so you can see the screen and then afterwards we'll have a colouring sheet. Saul, 
Saul was a Pharisee who hated the followers of Jesus so much that he would hunt them down to be brought to trial in Jerusalem. And he would even seek to murder them. Saul was uttering threats with every breath, and he was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest. He asked him to write a letter to the Jews in Damascus that would allow him to arrest any Christians he found there. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. Now Saul went on his way, and as he came near Damascus, a light from heaven flashed around him, and he heard a voice that said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul cried out, Who are you, Lord? And the voice said, I am Jesus. Rise and go into the city, and you will be told what to do. So Saul got up and he opened his eyes, but he couldn't see anything. So the men who were with Saul led him into the city. After three days, a man named Ananias came to Saul. He put his hands on Saul and immediately Saul could see again. And with that, Saul became a follower of Jesus. He became the very thing he had tried to hunt. And he immediately began telling people that Jesus is the Son of God. And he taught them about the mercy of God that he had received. And all who heard him were amazed. He then went by a new name, Paul as he began preaching not just to the Jewish people, but to everyone. Despite many difficulties like being imprisoned, shipwrecked, and narrowly escaping death multiple times, Paul continued to preach about Jesus. Paul said that he would do everything he could to save people and help them know God. And that's just what he did in order to reach people who would otherwise be unreached. And many came to know Jesus because of what Paul said. Paul taught many in his day through his letters, but even more have come to learn more about Jesus through the letters of Paul that can be read even to this day. Aren't they wonderful to see as little kids? I'd like to ask you to stand again as we sing as the deer.
It's my honour this morning to lead out in our congregational prayer and so I would ask that if you are able you kneel or otherwise if you would just bow as we pray. <clears throat> Almighty God, we long to worship you. We bow this morning in awe and adoration and praise. We praise you for being our maker, redeemer, defender and friend. Thank you for the great blessings you've given us in allowing us to come to you in prayer and to stand in your presence. Thank you for listening and answering our prayers, even when we don't like the answer. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for us. Thank you that you died the death that we should have died, that we can have the life that is yours. We ask for your forgiveness and we pray that you will help us to be forgiving. Help us to see our great need of you and we thank you for your great mercy and grace. Thank you that your righteousness is available to all who believe. Father, you have promised that there would be faith, hope and strength to meet life's problems. We thank you that you are in control and that nothing takes you by surprise. Please comfort and hold close all who mourn. Give healing to those who are sick. Give strength and assurance to all who face problems. Give rest to the weary. We also want to thank you for all the blessings that you give to us. Thank you for our families. We thank you for this church and we thank you for the gift of the Sabbath. We thank you for our pastors and for all those who willingly give their time and talents to our church. And we pray that you will bless Natasha as she speaks to us. Bless us as we listen to your word. We would ask this morning that you would bless those who are traveling and bring them home safely. We pray for the camp meetings that have been held, are being held and are yet to be held. May these meetings inspire your people and draw us closer to you. Thank you for this day, a new opportunity to love, give and be all that you want us to be. We ask that you will strengthen us, restore us, and inspire us with your love. We have hope and confidence that you are returning soon, and to that day we look. And we ask all of these things in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning, everyone, and happy Sabbath to you. I noticed this beautiful arrangement that's been up here, and apparently it was here from last week, so thank you to whoever uh, created this beautiful masterpiece. Me and flowers don't go together. I 
I stick things and it's still, it's ugly. But someone here has a talent and has been able to uh, create these beautiful floral arrangements. So I just want to thank you um, for that. And I feel like I haven't been here in a couple of weeks because I haven't. Um, so I was away at uh, Victorian Big Camp last week. Um, I was helping out at the Junior's Tent um, along with um, my friends Madden and Annie. They were helping me out as well. I know a few of you made the trek all the way to Ladner Park. It was a fair way um, to serve or to worship there as well. And um, I know that Denise said in her prayer that there has been big camps that have just finished. There are big, net, big camps currently in, in progress at the moment, and then there's more big camps to come uh, the end of this week. So wherever you are, if you're traveling, um, if you can get to a big camp, um, there's amazing speakers and activities there for young all the way to old. But we have my trusty backpack up here. Um, and I just want to say, like, Easter has just gone, and we have, the world has celebrated uh, the Passion Week, uh, the, the death, and then the resurrection of Jesus. And I stand here before you because we, we live knowing that Jesus is alive. Amen? And so, when, you, when we finish this story and we continue on after the Gospels, um, Jesus... Jesus said to the disciples, look, I have to go. Now that I'm alive, I have to go, but I'm not going to leave you here alone. Um, some of my youth are probably thinking, we talked about this last night and we talked about this this morning. Yes, we did. And that's okay. But Jesus had some final words for them and they were to go out to all of the world, to Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. But he didn't leave them alone. He gave them the Holy Spirit, but he said, be patient and wait, the Holy Spirit is coming. Now the apostles, the disciples, followers of Jesus, who are now about to go out into the world, well, they had to carry things with them, right? Now I brought here, this is what I use as my carry-on. I'm just gonna take this off. Now in my carry-on, this one is uh, a little bit smaller than the standard um, luggage size, but I've been caught out. I've flown somewhere before and my luggage didn't appear. When I arrived, the luggage wasn't there. It went on to another place. So I know what it's like to lose your luggage and only have to live with what's inside your backpack. So carry on is very important. Some of you probably put um, just your, your, your like a book, some a laptop, some other things, some personal things. But here's some of the things that I like to put in my carry-on. Let's have a look. Okay, I always take a puffer vest with me wherever I go. I have, uh, I take an empty water bottle because at most, at all airports, they you can fill your water bottle there. Um, I take in this little bag here. It's also a spare bag in case all of the stuff is overweight. I can chuck it in two bags and then they think I've got two bags instead of one. So in here is a spare pair of clothes. There's some tights in there, a t-shirt and some clothes. I've got some thongs in there. Um, I've tried to go mostly digital. So what that means is uh, I tried to do um, Kindle or put all my books on my phone. But for you old school people, I've got, see books there, a journal. Um, that's okay, old school is good, it just, it just weighs a lot. Um, in here I put uh, special medication, anything I need to take anywhere with me. I also hide my passport in here, because no one wants medicine. So I put my passport in there. I've got some toiletries, everything is 100 mils. Um, yeah, there's enough in there to last about a week. Um, everything in there from uh, soap, shampoo, tweezers to uh, underwear. Yes, you need underwear when you go places. And what else do we have in here? Um, I got a little bag full of electrics, meaning chargers, adapters. Um, if you're a USB-C, if you're a lightning person, just got to make sure they're all in there because nothing worse than not having to charge your um, devices and things. And here's my flash device where I can write things and take it like a Kindle or like a like a digital book. So it all fits in there. It's pretty pretty trusty, pretty good, and I can just sling it on my back, chuck it through security, and away I go. Now 
we don't really think about what the apostles were carrying. And in this morning's story, we had a look at Paul. Anyone remember our little children's story today? So his name was Paul. And the rest of Acts or the book of Acts talks about the life of Paul. Now, can you imagine what Paul was carrying in his carry-on luggage? It had to be the things that were like very important to him, the things that he needed everywhere he went. Now, the things that, so we're going to look at this morning, what was in Paul's carry-on luggage? Okay, so we've had a look. Beautiful. Now, in our children's story this morning, we witnessed and we saw and we heard about this amazing, amazing conversion experience that Paul had. He didn't just come to Jesus. He hated the followers of Jesus. He hated anyone that had to do with, with the way or Jesus, and he persecuted them. But... One day, it was, as he was walking down the road, he was blinded by a light. And in that light, someone said to him, why? Why are you doing this to us? Through that experience, he had this transformation which changed his life. And so in Acts 9, this conversion experience not only changes his eyes, but takes him from being Saul from Tarsus, but he then becomes Paul, who is able to now see, not only see the good news, but willing to share it. And so we come to his very first journey, which is now in Acts 10. Now in his first journey, I'm going to give you a map. This is a modern day map of the area that Paul will have visited. If you look up there, you can see, oh, yep, there's Spain. You can see Spain over here. There's Italy that looks like a boot. Next to them is Greece, Turkey, and then this is the top of Africa. Now, this is a modern-day map. Let's have a look now at a map from biblical times. Do you guys want to help me at the back? There we go. Now, as you can see... He traveled all the way from the Middle East through to Cyprus and into Asia Minor. Now, he did this all by foot or by boat. There was no trains. There was no buses. There was no bonza. There was none of that. He had to do everything by foot. But on this first journey, they didn't just make him go alone. He went with somebody. In Acts 13, verse 3, it says, Then having fasted and prayed and laying hands on him, they sent him away. Before Paul went, his community surrounded him. They fasted with him. They prayed for him. They laid hands on him. And then they sent him with the Holy Spirit. Whenever we go anywhere on our journey, we're never to go alone. We go with the encouragement, the endorsement, and with the support of the fellowship that we belong to. We can call it our community. We can call it our church. But not only that, it says this in Luke 10, verse 1 to 12. Let's read. If you want to turn, to, turn with me to Luke 10, verse 12. And I'm going to read for you there. Because Jesus said to them, you never go alone. You always go with something or somebody. And then he said these words in verse, we're in chapter, Luke chapter 10, verse 1. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into this harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or a bag or sandals, and do not, do not greet anyone on the road. Verse 5, when you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. 
If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Stay there, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. And then in verse 8 it says, When you enter a town and are welcome, eat what is offered to you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. But when you enter a town and are not welcomed, go into the streets and say, Even the dust of your town we wipe from our feet as a warning to you. Yet be sure of, the, of this, the kingdom of God has come near. And I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Don't go alone. He said to them, go out two by two. And not only that, go with the support, with the love, with the prayers of your community, of your fellowship, of your church. But then we come to the second part of the journey. In this second journey, before he went out, the entire first journey, he had spent time with a man by the name of Barnabas. Now, Barnabas was not only an amazing apostle for Jesus, but Barnabas, Barnabas took Paul under his wing. There was a time when they were in Jerusalem, and they Antioch, sorry, and they preached there for a whole entire year. And so what were they doing there? They were mingling together. They were sharing as friends. They were learning from each other. But Barnabas took Paul under his wing. Remember, when we go out, don't go alone, but go with somebody that we can mentor, that we can disciple. And Barnabas and Paul, for the first part of Acts, always mentions the name Barnabas first and then the name of Paul second. It isn't until a little bit later, which I'll explain, that they start mentioning the name of Paul first. Christians don't walk alone. And Barnabas had this knack of seeing people and seeing their potential and journeying alongside with them. So it came this time where they were going to head out onto their second journey. But something happened. Something happened between the two friends. They, they, were, they become good friends by this stage, but now there was a big disagreement between the two of them. So I'll show you the second part of his journey. This is the first part. You can see here goes from the Middle East all the way through here. But this is the second part of his journey. He not only doubled, but he extends the mission even further to the point where they reach. So they've reached all the way to Macedonia and parts of Greece. How amazing, just on foot, just by boats, just by ships, they were able to reach all of this area. But something happened between the two friends. Acts 15 tells us of this Jerusalem council that happens and how they're trying to minister to the Gentiles, but at the same time work out all these different things between what Gentiles were like and what Jews were like. And then Barnabas said to Paul, you know, I want to take on John Mark with us. Now, this, this young man had come with them earlier on in their journey, but then had decided not to follow them. And Barnabas, he still saw the potential in this young man, John Mark, who actually is the author of the book of Mark. He saw potential in him, but Paul said to him, I don't want him to come with us. He left us. We don't know what he's going to do. I don't want to journey with him as we go out to our next part of our journey. And so these two friends who've been journeying together for over a year now have this big disagreement. They have a big falling out. And he says to him, we have to part ways because what you want to do and what I want to do are very different. And even though what you want to do is furthering the kingdom of God, I have to do it my way. And it says this in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12 to 14. 
because this is what's happening right now, because this happens more often than not in the body of Christ, our church, our community. And it says this, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. You see, unity is not uniformity. Being unified in Christ doesn't mean we have all the same opinions. Paul and Barnabas, they loved each other like brothers, and yet they disagreed on this. It seemed like one little thing, but it ended up separating them. Unity is not uniformity. Each and every one of us is a member of one body, but we are all unique. We all have our own special personalities. We all have our own unique set of abilities and skills that we bring. You see, often we look at people, characters of the Bible, we think, man, they had it all together. Well, actually, they were human beings like us who didn't have it all together. And it says here, did you know Paul was so special? He in himself had this amazing, unique set of abilities because he was Jewish by birth. He was educated in the Greek and he could write and he could, he could uh, teach in Greek. But not just that, he was a Roman citizen. Who better than Paul to be able to reach the Decapolis, the Gentiles, Asia Minor, the ends of the world with the gospel for God. Anyone he encountered, that's why there's a verse that says, to the Jew I was a Jew, and to the Greek I was a Greek. Paul was able to use his unique set of abilities to reach the person that was in front of him. You see, the Holy Spirit gifts all of us with different, unique sets of skills and abilities. I mean, can you imagine everybody being the same person in church? It would actually be, you'd probably get a lot more done, <laughs> but it'd be very boring. And we wouldn't have a lot of creative and different ways of doing something. Each of us is endowed and the Holy Spirit gifts us with gifts that will be culturally relevant to you and to that person that you meet wherever you go. And it is such an opportunity because it becomes not just I tell, you tell, you tell someone else. It becomes, no, a multiplying movement, an opportunity to do so much more. And if you look back, maybe Paul and Barnabas had to have had that disagreement in order for the ministry to double, even triple its effectiveness all over, all over the world and to the places where they went. So we have the third journey of Paul. So in the third journey... You can see he went back to the, pretty much the same places that he went to. And he was able to do this. Revisit people, review where they were, and reflect on their now experience with following Jesus. And this is something that we also need to be doing. He went back and encouraged. And he said, now that you've found Jesus and you're walking in the way, I'm going to continue to encourage you to do the same and to do more because God has given you more. We need to revisit, review, and reflect. And then repeat. Repeat. We're never to stay stagnant, to stay in the same place. God is asking us to grow. 
More than that, there's this verse in 12, Romans 12, verse 2, which talks about transformation of the mind. Because the Holy Spirit was doing a work. So every time Paul would visit somebody, things were growing and moving in such a way that he could not understand, that he could not explain. But he was always led by the Holy Spirit to go. So in the final journey, we find that Paul is now in jail, and it says these words. Then Paul dwelt two whole years in his own rented house and received all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no one forbidding him. Now he remained there for two years. He was writing letters, people that came to his home, he was encouraging them, he was supporting them. But you think, how was Paul being supported? How did he have the means or the funds to pay for his lodgings, to pay for this house, to pay for his food? We live today in, some would say, a blessed social structure where we have social welfare. We have a system that if you end up in jail, you will have a roof over your head, you will have food, there is even programs to rehabilitate you and to bring you back to society. We live in a time and place where most people do not go hungry. Most people have somewhere to live and there is some sort of income coming into your banks. But what about this time? Who was Paul relying on? Who was helping him? Who was paying for this house? where he was living. It draws us back to this image of when Israel had first left Egypt. When they first left, they left only with their possessions, the things that they could carry, their livestock, their children. They didn't carry anything with them. They, they didn't even carry enough wood to make a fire. And so it's interesting that the first night, what appears? A pillar of fire. And as they continued on in the desert, they had the cloud that followed them everywhere they went. And then food was provided for them in the way of manna and of quails. Water, everywhere they went, there was water bubbling from places. Bitter, bitter, bitter water was turned into sweet water. Israel depended on God in the wilderness and the mercy of others. And so this is what Paul had, dependence on God and reliance on the mercy of others. You see, because in his last days, Paul's eyesight was going, he had been beaten and he had been thrown around, he had been stoned so many times. We don't actually know how many aches and pains were in his body. But even in the end, he was still willing to share the message of Jesus and of his good news in his life. And so what can we draw from the life of Paul? What can we draw from this amazing journey? Because this is just an overview of what Paul's life was like. We can definitely draw this. He was equipped and he was empowered to go. He didn't go alone. He walked with others. And he was empowered by the Holy Spirit to go. He had the encouragement, the support, and the affirmation of his community, of his fellowship of believers, of his friends, that no matter where he went, he knew people were praying for him. Unity is not uniformity. What Paul had to bring is going to be different to what you have to bring to people in front of you. Each and every one of us is gifted with a unique set of abilities. We can use those to reach others for Jesus. And revi revisit, review, reflect. 
You know, what's inside my carry-on has been a work in progress for a couple of years. The bag's gotten smaller, the things have gotten, like I have a better quality down vest than didn't before. You know, like every, every year I have to revisit it and reflect, okay, is this still working for me? Are these things important to me as I go on my journey? Continue to revisit. And for those that have, you have met along your path, who you've now shared about Jesus, Revisit them and see where they're going. Affirm them, support them, so that they may continue to do the same for others. And last but not least, the dependence on God. Paul's full dependence, he had all the raw materials. And my Sabbath school class is like, we made Play-Doh this morning. Yes, we made Play-Doh this morning. But all those raw materials were able to come together because of the warm water, the Holy Spirit that we use to bind them all together. And not just that, the mercy of others. There are so many people that we can be grateful to and thankful for who have helped us along in, in our journeys. And so what can we glean from the life of Paul? What can you glean from the life of Paul? His purpose, what he carried with him, who he carried with him, and ultimately his relationship with God and how the Holy Spirit was able to fuse those things together and he was able to share that with others. You know, Paul says in Philippians 1.21, for to live is Christ and to die is gain. And so what? We often stay at our season of Easter. Jesus died, but Jesus is alive. But it's time to take stock because Jesus, he gave us this amazing commission of Judea, Samaria, and to the rest of the world. So maybe it's Mildura, Dayton, and to the rest of the Sunraysia community. But it doesn't need to end there. And maybe we just need to have a look. What are we carrying with us? Time to take stock and take some things out, add some new things back in and reflect on what is working and what isn't working. You know, Paul walked with God. He constantly needed God and the Spirit wherever he went. And Jesus was the same, even though he was God on foot, he had this constant dependence on his Father. Jesus would never ask us to do, to go, or to endure something that he has not. But he will equip us for what is next. And he will empower us through prayer and through the laying of hands and the Holy Spirit. You know, we are never alone in our journey with him. The Holy Spirit, Jesus has gone now, his physical presence is not here with us, but the personal presence of God the Father and of Jesus is here with us as the Holy Spirit. Our final hymn, it says these words, and I ask our team to come up. Our final hymn says, I will follow you, Jesus, wherever you want me to go. And the last part of it says, by his grace, through Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit, I will continue to follow him. In Jesus' name we, we say, amen. Let's stand together and enjoy this wonderful hymn.
Oh, Father God, we thank you that you not only came to this earth to show us who you are, to show us your glory, but to die for us, to rise again, and then to leave us with this amazing charge to follow not only you, but to share this with so many others. Lord, we do live in a world that is full of tribulation and full of uncertainty and Lord, we can glean from the life of Paul. Even for him, there was so much uncertainty and things changing all the time. But we can know and trust that your Holy Spirit walks with us. Lord, it is the personal presence of Jesus and of God, the Holy Spirit who empowers us, who gives us the ability to go out. And Lord, we thank you that the Holy Spirit not only goes with us, but gifts us with these unique abilities to reach special people and people that others would never be able to reach for you. And so, Father God, as we leave now and as we commit our lives to you, we pray for a blessing and we pray that your spirit may not only go before us, around us and surround us with your love. We thank you, Lord, for the fellowship of this amazing church here at Mildura, and we thank you that we can be a beacon of light um, to those in our, in our area and to those that come in contact with us no matter where we go. So, Lord, dismiss us now with your blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>